fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear much fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask in my father's name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of God endures forever. Amen. Please be seated. Again, we have the richness of Jesus addressing his disciples as he prepares to leave them, as he will finish his work on the cross, as he will ascend into glory, as he will leave them, not as orphans, but will send his spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, to dwell within them. We think in chapter 14 we have looked at the Son. The life in him. That Jesus says he is that life. That he is that source of all life. And that we are to be united to him by faith. Believing in him. We have thought about the Holy Spirit, the helper. Another helper that will be sent. That the disciples would not be left as orphans. Who will reveal to them the glory of Jesus Christ. The hope of salvation. And now as we turn to John 15, we see now the third person of the Trinity, God the Father, and his place in this. As he would be glorified, as he would be glorified in his Son, in his children, that they might produce much fruit. This morning we look at our passage and we think about Jesus as the true vine. And we think about God the Father as the vine dresser. To think, what does that mean for you and for me? How is this a great and glorious truth that is the foundation for your life and mine? Well, think of what Jesus says. I am the true vine. Why does Jesus use this imagery? There are some who have suggested that Jesus and the disciples have left the upper room, that they go out and there they see a vine growing and Jesus stops under it and he says, I am the true vine. I think more likely that Jesus is thinking about the Old Testament. That the imagery of a vine is used of Israel. That it was God who took Israel out of Egypt as a vine and planted it in Canaan, the promised land, that they would grow and prosper and fill the land. And this is the imagery that is used in the Old Testament. But we know that Israel as a vine did not produce the fruit of righteousness, that it was fruit that was rotten. It was unacceptable. And therefore Jesus now says, I am the true vine. 
You see, in the Old Testament, if people were going to be God's people, they were to be a part of Israel. And yes, it was open to others from other lands, but they would come to Israel, they would associate and say, I am a part of Israel. They would take on that identity with Israel as God's people. But as a vine, they failed. We see then how God promises something more. In Psalm 80, there is the plea to God, Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. Here is the recognition. Israel was that vine. And then the plea, turn again, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see and have regard for this vine, the stock of your right hand, that it was planted, and for the son whom you made strong for yourself. They have burned it with fire, they have cut it down. May they perish at the rebuke of your face. But let your hand be on the man of your right hand, the son of man, whom you have made strong for yourself. Now here you see the imagery of that vine together with this son of man. And how did Jesus identify himself? As the son of man. He is the one who has come and revealed God. And therefore he says now to the disciples, I am the true vine. And what is he implying? What does he mean by that? that he is the one that they must be connected to, identified with if they are to be God's people. That in the Old Testament, it was Israel, taken out of Egypt, planted in Canaan, but now, here is the Son of Man, who is the true vine. This is the last of the I am sayings of Jesus in the book of John. We have seen earlier some of the claims where Jesus would say, I am. There would be a translation of the very name of God revealed to Moses. I am that I am. And Jesus in saying, I am, is identifying himself with God. And he has the sayings revealing who he is. And here he says, I am the true vine. Not simply another vine. I am the true vine. And if Jesus is the vine, we find ourselves to be the branches. And here, it's something so easy that we can all picture. Even the children amongst us. We we think of a vine as it is growing up. We think of the branches that come off of it. And Jesus is saying, I am the vine. And we immediately understand that the branches are dependent on the vine. That Jesus has called the disciples to himself. He has called them. And they have heard his word. And that word, Jesus says, has made you clean. But now what are they to do? They are to remain in him. They are to remain tied, connected to him. They are called to abide in him. And this is language that we have already seen in chapter 14, where there is that spirit that will abide in them, that will remain in them, that they would have this connection to life. And here, is a distinction that there is that dependence upon Jesus. And if those who would not depend on Jesus, what is their source? They have no source of life. The branches die. They are cut out. They are bundled. They are burned. Here is that presentation of the judgment of God of those who are not in Christ Jesus. And we think about that. Jesus is making these vast, exclusive claims as he has done earlier. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
And you see the challenge. We can't simply say, well, Jesus was a nice guy. His claims go far beyond that. Our response to him must be, yes, I will trust in him for my life, now and forever. Or we will reject him, saying how pretentious. For someone to say, I exclusively am the way, the truth, the life. And here Jesus again is saying, if you are not in me, you have no life. <laughs> for fruitfulness, for life, there must be the connection of the branches to the vine. And Jesus uses this simple obedience. And Jesus ties that love to obedience. We have noted that all through this passage. Again and again, there is a connection of love and obedience. That it is because we have seen the love of God in Jesus Christ, we desire to obey him. If we are brought into fellowship with God, then we think of, of what does that mean? It means we recognize that in Jesus, there's the source of our life. And what does Jesus explain to them? His great desire all through his ministry has been to honor and obey the Father, to glorify him. This was his desire. Therefore, he was obedient to the Father because of his love. We need to think about our obedience to God. We need to think about what it means to be connected to Jesus as a branch is connected to the vine. Do you know your absolute dependence on Jesus? Jesus didn't come and say, there's the right path, follow it, I'll meet you at the end. It's as a branch that depends every moment on the nourishment and the life-giving sap of, of the vine. So it is that your life is dependent upon Jesus. And to recognize that is to say, all that I have, all that I am, is because of the love of God that flows to me through Jesus Christ. And therefore, I desire to obey him. Is that what you can say? How easy it is to fall into a trap of thinking, I better obey or God's not going to be happy with me. He's going to zap me. He's going to bring something terrible into my life. And we need to remember God is love. And his people who are trusting in Jesus Christ, united to him, God is working all things for their good. His love is not conditioned upon us meeting perfect standards that we can never meet. His love is rooted in his character and his commitment to us in Jesus Christ. And Jesus, as that true vine, reminds us that there, there is a vine dresser there is someone overseeing all of this work that is being done, that God would be glorified. And what is the desire of God? It is that there might be fruit produced. That God would be able to delight himself in the fruit that is produced in his people. Now, some people have even the audacity to say, well, why does God get all the glory? Why does God say, it is mine, it is my fruit? And here it shows us the ignorance of some people of who God is in his very being. That he is the one who is sovereign. He is the one who has created all things. And does he not have the absolute right to expect from his creation to be glorified? 
And then we go beyond in Scripture to see that while that is true and, and God is worthy to be praised because of who he is, yet God has come to his creation after the rebellion of mankind and comes to them in love, in grace. And do we then say, it's not fair that you get the ultimate glory? We say, of course God desires and deserves everything my whole heart, my whole life, my whole being is to be a sacrifice of praise to God because of who he is and because of what he has done. And therefore, we, we look at this fruit that is to be produced in your life and mine that is to be the glory of God shining in us. But we had then have to ask the question, what is that fruit? What is to be produced in your life and in mine? We think of a vine and we'd say, well, there's grapes that are produced. What is it then in my life, in yours? And we recognize that the scripture teaches us that it is first a matter of the heart. Even as we looked at that, that revelation of God's will, there is first that love for God. It is out of this that there is going to be the production of fruit. And when we then think about that fruit, we may think in Scripture. Where do we find fruit? And we, we go to Galatians and we think of the fruit of the Spirit. And what is it? It's not producing fruit certain things on the earth is the expression of the heart, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. These the fruit produced in us as we are tied to Jesus as the branches to the vine. And notice that these are matters of the heart, an orientation, a desire. And then out of that will flow our words, our thoughts, our deeds. And there is our fruit, but at root it deals with a character reflecting who God is. And therefore we are not surprised that we see the focus here on love. Jesus commands to love one another, to love God. Why? Because God reveals himself to be love. God is love. And therefore, we see it in the fruit that we have, that we are enabled to love. And there are some people that we just say, well, we naturally love. I have grandchildren. I, I love them. It's like, how could you not? Some people might not, I, but I'd say, but then there are others. We say, wait, am I called to love them too? They're not as cute. They're not as nice as my grandchildren. And Jesus says we are called to love even our enemies. Now the form of that will be different than love for family. But what is our heart's orientation? Do we have a disposition of love, of a readiness to forgive, to remember with kindness, to leave vengeance to the Lord? And we, we don't then disassociate our actions from the fruit. But we want to make sure that the foundation is the love of God. That it is that love that comes to us through Jesus Christ, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That this is the fruit then that comes out in our lives. And we can't help but produce that fruit. 
or we show that we are dead. And we think of the deeds that God calls us to do. I want to use an illustration to, to help us think about this and to marvel at it. Imagine that you are called to build a house for someone's son. Somebody calls you up and says, I know you don't have a lot of experience, but you can get all the help you need. And I want you to build a house. I want you to design it. I want it to be grand. I want it to be glorious. I want it to be marvelous. And there's no limit on the money you can spend. You could spend $5 million on it, okay, but it's got to be beautiful. And you go out and you, you work and you work and you labor and, and, and you think, man... And you look at this house that's coming up, and, and yes, it's turning out to be beautiful. And you finally finish it. And you think, boy, that was a lot of work. And the owner comes, and he says, this is your house. I consider you my son. And you think, all the work that I was called to do, the times that I thought, man, is this really worth it? And then it turns out it is given to you. And you think about what God calls you to do in our lives. And this pruning that, that is talked about, every branch in me that bears fruit, he prunes. What is pruning? It, it's cutting away a part of the branch so that it might be more fruitful. And we are called to bear fruit, and, and we know that in, the li in our lives, in the world, sometimes it's hard. We face temptations. We face limitations. We struggle. And then all of a sudden something happens, and, and it's like a part of us is cut off. And we lose a loved one. We lose a job. And we say, God, what is going on? And God is pruning so that we might be more fruitful. And we say, how does that work? Well, even in, in vines, and not many of us have much experience, including me, but you think about when they have the grapes and they have this vineyard, what do they do? They, they let it go wild and pick off the grapes and say, well, I hope it's going to be even more full next year. Well, no, they go and they prune. And sometimes if you look at how much they prune, you kind of go, how is that going to produce any fruit? They've cut it back so much. And yet that's what's necessary for the vine through its branches to produce a bountiful harvest. So it is with God. He loves you so much that he will prune in your life, taking away those things that will be a hindrance for your fellowship with him. They will make you fruitful. They will make you grow in your love for him. As you, you recognize your absolute dependence upon Jesus, sometimes we produce that fruit and say, look at, look at this. And we begin to depend on ourselves. And as God prunes, we say, oh, I need to be reminded that fruit was because God was at work in me. And God is at work pruning in every one of our lives. And how do we find an expression of that? In 2 Corinthians the Apostle Paul, as he writes to the church there, having come through difficult circumstances himself, he, he speaks to that church. He has known that pruning. And what does he write to them? 2 Corinthians 1 at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. 
You see how Paul understood what God was doing in his life? Paul had, had come to the end of his rope, we might say, in our language. That, and yet, he knew the comfort of God. And he could write to the, the church at Corinth, who was suffering things as well, and he says, here is the comfort. It is what I have experienced, and I can testify of it. And I want to share that comfort with you. And as we are led in our lives, as we are pruned by God, we can speak words of comfort. And we, we always speak words of comfort, but we understand that somebody who has gone through what we have gone through, who can say, I've been there. I've suffered through that. There is a bond, there is a comfort that comes as they can testify, God sustained me. He helped me, he strengthened me. And therefore we can give that comfort as we have been comforted. And it is to the fruit, it is to the praise of God that he is able, that he is sufficient and that we depend upon him. And who do we think of who fulfilled this most perfectly but Jesus Christ? We think of the Son of God, eternal, enjoying that perfect fellowship with the Father in all eternity, who is God. And what do we read about Jesus? In Philippians, we read about him humbling himself, taking on the form of a servant, and humbling himself to death. And not only death, but death on the cross with all of his ignominy, with all of the rejection of the people. And therefore, Jesus knows he is that faithful high priest. There is nothing that you or I will suffer that Jesus has not suffered far beyond what we are able to think. He came from eternal glory to the death on the cross. And he is able to comfort. And he sends God the Holy Spirit to be that comforter. And so we think of all the things that, in a sense, we might say were pruned from Jesus, God incarnate. He was pruned of all the glory and honor that should have rightfully been him, his, as the perfect man, as the son of David, as the one who spoke truth. And yet, he had to endure the lies of man, the hatred of man, the scorn of man. And he had to bear their judgment. And then we begin to see Jesus as he comes to us, as he invites us, come to me, you are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. And Jesus knows all those burdens. He has endured them. And he took them upon himself that he might give us peace. That he might give us life. And it is Jesus who offered his life. The praise, the fruit of his lips might be praised to his father. And this is what we are called to do. To seek first his kingdom. To acknowledge God as our king. To follow his directives. To follow his commands. To say, here is my life. Everything that I have, I owe to you. And what is... 
What is the wonder? We think of the desire of God, that there might be fruit in your life, in my life, to his praise. But what is the wonder? The delight of God. The delight of God first in his son, Jesus Christ. Who took upon himself to be obedient to the Father. We read again and again in the book of John. That Jesus did not come to do his own will, but the will of his heavenly Father. This was his purpose. This was his desire. But in what context? Even as he faced the cross, Hebrews 12 reminds us, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. He knew he would be exalted by his Father. Even as he produced that fruit of obedience to the glory of his Father, his Father would glorify him. And he speaks to that even in our passage. That the Father has loved me. Because of his willing, loving obedience. He receives that love that would glorify him. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And what is the wonder that God delights in all of his children who are adopted into his family? You and me, as we are united to Christ, joined to him as branches to a vine. And Jesus speaks to the disciples, you are my friends. Do you appreciate what that means? You are my friends. Sometimes we talk about, oh, if I could only have friends in high places, <laughs> what they could do for me, the word that they could speak for me, the opportunities I would have. And Jesus, as your friend, speaks to the Father. It says, here is my friend. Bless him. Bless him. Do we see the, the position, the glory that is ours? That we are called to bear fruit to God, our Father. To glorify him in all things. And yet as we, as we pursue that, God pours out his blessing. In this life and in the life to come, he draws near to us and he says, you are my child. And you will be glorified with my son, Jesus. You will reign with him forever. And there is the wonder. And as we go through the pruning as we go through the losses and crosses and all the trials and difficulties, as we say, Lord, may me faithful, sustain me. As we give glory to God as he blesses us, God is preparing for us that dwelling with him. Remember how Jesus said, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. I go to prepare a place for you. That is where is our hope. And then we begin to see our lives so differently. All these rules and commands of God that hinder us. No. Lord, I am yours. You have made me your friend. You have promised me everlasting glory. Lord, how can I now give expression to my gratitude? We say, I want to be holy like my God. I want to live in that hope. And it was John who wrote this gospel, who reflects on this and writes later in his first letter to the church. I want to close here. 
1 John chapter 3. As a summary of, of John, the apostle. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. That we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it, it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself because he is pure. You see how, how John draws this together again? Thinking of what God has done for us. And the love that we respond, and therefore, everyone who hopes this way purifies himself because he is pure. We want to be like God. We don't say grace is licensed to sin. We say grace is to make me like Jesus. Pure, holy, living my entire life for his praise. And there is our hope. There is our glory. May God bless us in that knowledge. Amen. Let us pray. Oh Lord, I we thank you for the richness of your word. That you, by your spirit, gave inspiration to John that he might write these words of Jesus. That we might know the Son. That we might know the Spirit. That we might know the Father that we might be in